welcome to Lindale Baptist Church. Let's stand together. We'll join in in singing glory to his name. sing the chorus God is so good God is so good he's so good to me and that's certainly true isn't it one more time without the instruments a cappella. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He is so good to me. Amen. Very good. You may be seated. At this time, Brother Stephen's going to come, and we are at the end of 1 John, believe it or not. So if you turn your Bible to 1 John chapter 5, starting with verse number 12, and uh, Brother Stephen will read that for us this morning. First 
1 John chapter 5 and verse 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. All right, good morning. Good to see everybody today and glad to be in God's house with God's people. And uh, I tell you, um, in this world that we live in right now, I'm always glad to come to church. And uh, there's so much craziness going on. Uh, I want to take a minute and just say this. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people, they get, all, they get their feathers all ruffled about um, politics. And, you know, you can't talk about politics in church. But if you watch the two conventions the last couple weeks and you're confused about where you need to vote and how you need to vote and who you need to vote for, um, there's a problem. Amen. Uh, it was very, very uh, clear and plain. I've never been prouder to be a Republican as I was this week. And uh, to see them help um, a guy out of a wheelchair uh, that's given his life to uh, serve our country and to hear them be so uh, transparent about the, 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 the horrid, horrid, practice of um, abortion and all of the people that they brought in and uh, just it it made me excited to be an American and I tell you what uh, there's only one choice if you're a Christian uh, unless you're going to write in somebody's name there's only one choice out of those two candidates uh, that that you could choose and uh, that 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 would that would bring glory to God in any way and uh, so I want to encourage you with that uh, I tell you, I, I, can't, I couldn't stomach the things that I'm seeing right now that are going on in our country against the police officers. Uh, we ought to be against all that. Uh, and I know, I know some are going to say, well, there's, there's a bad cop. Well, have you ever seen everybody in every profession be perfect? And I, I don't judge all doctors by one bad doctor, right? How many doctors have, have, have done malpractice? I don't, I, don't judge, I don't judge all preachers by one bad preacher. Amen. Like, we, uh, we, we need to wake up. This, what's going on with Black Lives Matter, it's a disgrace in our country. And as believers, we need to, I think we need to stand against that stuff. And uh, so um, I want to encourage you, uh, don't be passive this year come November. You, everybody in here ought to go vote. And uh, if you care about what's going on in our country, you care about the, the things that are, that are, that are evil, and you care about things that need to change, uh, you need to be a part of going and voting in November. And, and I, I want to encourage you to do that. Encourage everybody you know to get out and vote. And um, that's, that's, that's what, as, as American citizens, that's our right and that's our duty uh, to get out and do that. All right? Uh, this morning, uh, I, I appreciate all these people up here helping us. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. All right? And uh, so Brother Kyle's going to come. He's going to lead us in a song this morning, Amazing Grace. Let's stand together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I want 
sing the scripture song, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. singing the words of scripture. Uh, we're going to sing one more song before Brother Chris comes. Jesus, thank you. And uh, this one we like to sing here. And uh, truly we are thankful for the salvation that the Lord has given us. So let's sing this. Jesus, thank you.
be seated. Thank you for singing this morning. Uh, at this time, Brother Chris is going to be singing for us, Jesus Passed By, and you'll be praying for Pastor as he comes with the sermon this morning. So deep within, then that king became my savior. Now his riches are mine, and I became changed when Jesus passed by. When Jesus passed by, when Jesus passed by. He'll hear your cry. You know something happened when Jesus passed by. I was a beggar in the rags of my sin. So deep within, then that king became my savior. Now his riches, they're all mine. And I became God's child when Jesus passed by. When Jesus passed by, when Jesus passed by. Gone were all the heartaches, trouble and strife. You can reach out and touch him, and he'll hear your cry. You know something happened when Jesus passed by. You know something. When Jesus passed by. Thank you, Chris. And um, appreciate everybody being here today. I said what I said a few minutes ago about the elections because this is a very important election coming up and uh, four years ago I preached a message concerning the Christians responsibility and in, in, in the elections and and I got an email and the person's not here anymore so don't try to figure out who it was but I got an email that said pastor you shouldn't be talking about politics in the church and uh, the problem is that there's nothing that states that a pastor can't talk about politics in a church Quite honest with you, everybody's like, separation of church and state, that's not, that's not even a thing. You go look it up, it's not really even a thing. And there used to be a day in America where people wanted to know what their pastor thought about the elections, who to vote for, why. This year, you shouldn't need my help, it's pretty, pretty plain and pretty clear. But this morning, our country's in a mess. And I know there's, a, I know there's pastors in California, no one specifically, He's going, to get, he's going to get fined $10,000 a day to meet. 5000 in the morning, 5000 in the evening. They have, a, they have a Christian college, and if they choose to have college, they're going to get five, fined $5,000 every day that they have let their kids meet for school to study the Bible. They're going to get fined $5,000 a day. And we've got these riots and looting 
and all this stuff that's going on. Go look at the pictures. They're not wearing masks. They're not social distancing. They're not getting shut down. And, they, and you talk to the politicians, well, they have a right to assemble. Well, so do, so do believers. And uh, so uh, I, I believe with all my heart, like we're, we're on the cusp right now of seeing some really bad things happen in our country. And, uh, and it's important. Uh, it's really, really important. This morning I want to preach a message entitled this, God's Grace. God's Grace. If you have your Bibles, you can kind of get a jump start with me. And uh, we're going to be in Jonah, obviously. Uh, we've been in Jonah. And, uh, but we're going to also be in a couple other places. You can put a finger in Jonah and turn with me to Psalm chapter 73. Uh, Psalm chapter 73. just a second to get there I don't know why it is but I can find Jonah in two seconds any other day of the week and I get up here in the pulpit and I pass by it every time amen there's a special heaviness or darkness that you could say that sometimes comes to those who work hardest in serving the Lord uh, I, I'll give you my own personal testimony. This year has been one of my hardest years in ministry. And uh, for a lot of people, COVID, you know, they've sat at home and they've done different things. But there's been a lot of people, there's been a lot of people dealing with depression, a lot of people dealing with, I mean, lack of friends. And, uh, and so the, the, the amount of problems that I've had to deal with personally, dealing with people and counseling, has been at an all-time high. And, uh, and then you take away the fact that uh, back in January... There used to be a lot of fellowship amongst believers, and, and, then you, and that, that just hasn't been uh, a, big, a big thing here the last several months, and so there's times where there's a special heaviness or darkness that comes to those who work the hardest in serving the Lord. And I want you to hang on with me, you know, because I know, I know maybe your thought this morning is, well, if you love Jesus, it shouldn't be heaviness, but I, I think if you hold on with me, you'll see what I'm trying to say, and I know it may seem weird, but there's a great temptation that mature believers face to resent or become bitter towards God. Most pastors and missionaries, I believe, have faced this at some point in their lives, if they were honest, and the more that you do for God, the easier it is to feel that God owes you. And you you serve God and you put everything that you have into serving God. And if you're not careful, I'm just saying if you're not careful, there's a temptation that comes along with uh, being bitter at God because, you know, God... I'm doing this for you, and, and then I look at my enemies, and they seem to be prospering. I look, at, I look at my life, and I seem to be losing. And so, God, I don't understand, and there's a great temptation to become bitter at the Lord. And if you stretch yourself out in serving God, don't be surprised when this heaviness sneaks up on you, and it'll sneak up on you. One day you'll be great, you'll be on the mountaintop, and the next day you'll wake up and you'll say, what in the world is going on? Many people will never experience this because they won't put the effort into serving God like Jonah did. So we must be careful about being critical of Jonah. Uh, You know, it's easy to become critical of Jonah. Jonah, uh, you know, he preaches the revival and people get saved and then he gets mad at God and he gets discouraged. And you might say, well, Jonah's just, Jonah's being a crybaby. Jonah's being this or Jonah's being that. Jonah's not right with God. But Jonah was a mature believer. Understand this. He was a cross-cultural missionary. He was a preacher of God's word. And you might even think that a man who had experienced miracles in his personal life and revival through his ministry would be full of joy and be full of thanksgiving. But that's not what we see in Jonah's life. After all the triumphs of God's grace, Jonah was angry. He was frustrated. And he was out of sorts with God. You know, on the surface, it seems hard to believe. How is it possible to serve God and end up bitter at God? It seems like a contradiction. How do I experience God's grace in my life and still struggle with the God that I love? 
This was Jonah's experience, and I would say this morning he's not alone. And I want to look at, uh, take a second and look at a couple of other people real quick who dealt with this same thing. But here, in, if you were in Psalm there 73, Asaph was King's, King David's music director. All right? He was the Kyle Cox of, uh, of, of the king's court there, uh, leading the music. He was the music director. He walked with God. He led God's people in worship. But like Jonah, he went through a dark experience in which he says this in Psalm 73 too. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. That was Asaph's words there. So what is going on here? Asaph saw that God allows the wicked to prosper. And he couldn't figure out why. And the more he thought about it, the more perplexed he became in his life. And God seemed to be kinder to his enemies than to his friends. You see, if we're not careful, we can fall in this trap of thinking, what is the point of struggling to live a holy life? When God seemingly takes action, no action against the wicked, and we see God's people or God's friends struggle. If God allows evil men to prosper... Why should I keep my heart pure? You see, not only did Asaph struggle with this, but if you were to go to the New Testament, you would see the story of the prodigal son. And the older brother had a similar problem. The older brother worked hard for his father. While in many people's eyes, the no good brother left home and wasted the family inheritance on sinful living. Then when the no good brother came home, the father forgave him, through a party and the older brother's looking at this and saying where's the justice in that that makes no sense it's not fair so Jonah Asaph and the oldest brother they were all in the same place they were angry with God about grace and I would dare say a good many of us struggle with those same feelings this morning. And you may not understand that you're struggling with this feeling. But I think by the end of the sermon today, you're going to understand, you're going to understand where I'm coming from. And you'll, you'll have to probably admit with me that you may even struggle with this area of grace. But the first thing I want to talk, talk to you about if you're taking notes is this. We see that there was anger with God about grace. There was anger with God about grace. If you're in the book of Jonah, look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Why was Jonah angry? We'll go back to chapter 3 there in the last verse, verse 10. We're going to see why he was angry. And God saw their works, that they turned away from the evil way. And God repented of the evil. That, and he's talking about... The, destroying or bringing judgment to the city of city of Nineveh God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not so Jonah is angry about God's grace God, Jonah is angry that God showed grace to the people of Nineveh the people repented and God showed grace the truth of the matter is God's people have experienced and celebrated grace from the very beginning normally people are excited when they see the grace of God go with me real quick in your Bible to Exodus chapter number 34 Exodus chapter number 34 I want to read a few verses look at verse 6 with me we're going to read down through verse 9 Exodus 34 verse 6 the Bible says this, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Verse 8, and Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. 
we see here in this passage. God's people had experienced the grace of God many times through the years. And those words have been passed down from generation to generation. And Jonah was aware of not only how he had experienced God's grace, but how the people and the nations had also experienced God's grace. And so he turns to God and complains. Go back with me to Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. He complains to God. Jonah 4 verse 2, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was this not my saying? I told you so, God. When I was yet in my country, before I made this long journey over here, I told you this, God. Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. You see, Nineveh had a long history of wickedness. And Jonah felt sure that even if the Ninevites repented, they would eventually turn back to their wickedness. Right? And he was right. Jonah knew what was going to happen, and he was right. The people who repented were soon replaced by a generation who went back to their old ways of violence and torture. Just 40 years after Jonah's ministry in Nineveh, the ten tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel were crushed, and they were scattered by the brutal Assyrians. And the book of Nahum describes the atrocities of that time. Nahum chapter 3 and verse 3 says, The horsemen lifted up both the, uh, the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of the corpse. They stumbled upon their own corpse. You see, all of this suffering could have been avoided if God had destroyed Nineveh in the time of Jonah. The prophet saw it, saw it coming, and he said, God, your mercy is making me mad. I want you to think about your own life for just a second. I want you to think about what's going on in your life. You know, if we're not careful, what we, what we do is we, we see, a, we see a, an addict or we see an alcoholic. Praise God, we, we had the opportunity last night and delivered saying over at Mount Holly uh, Chapel and, and, uh, and I had the opportunity to preach over there last night and uh, the end of the service, uh, a man walked up front, gave his life to the Lord and uh, says, I've been an alcoholic. And, uh, and he says, uh, tonight I'm not gonna bow to uh, alcoholism anymore. And, uh, and praise God. But you know what? You know what? Some people I'm sure were sitting there thinking last night. I'm sure some were sitting there thinking, yeah, right. Yeah, right. You're saying you're putting down the bottle, but tomorrow when it's a new day, you're going to pick the bottle back up. And that's our attitude about people. Oh, a drug addict comes to Christ. Well, he's going to go back to his drug addict ways. You know what? He probably will. Jonah predicted that the Ninevites would go back at one point to their old style of living. But you know what? That's not our business. That's not my business to bestow grace to them. That's not your business to bestow grace to them. That's God's business. God's the one that has all authority to bestow grace. And if God wanted to bestow grace on these Ninevites, he has all ability to do that. You know, it's really not hard to relate to Jonah's problem. If God had wiped out Hitler, or Osama bin Laden, or Saddam Hussein, or Fidel Castro, when they were young, the world would have been spared from unspeakable evil and suffering. But God let them live. Why? I'll give you the answer, because God is a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness. That was Jonah's complaint. And if you have experienced God seemingly being kinder to your enemies than to you, or you've experienced evil in your life, that may be your complaint also. God, why would you allow this to happen to me? God, why would you allow my enemies to prosper? God could have intervened and he could have stopped evil from happening, but he didn't. He allowed it and you suffered. I want you to understand this this morning. Grace means that God may bless people who have wronged you. You got to write that down. Grace, if we're going to talk about grace this morning, grace means that God may bless people who have wronged you. God may bless people from whose sins you have suffered. 
You know, I think about, a, think about maybe a lady that's been raped. What a horrible thing. But you know, it's possible that at some point God reaches down and shows grace to the guy that did that. It's, it's unfathomable for us. But see, I don't get to choose who God shows grace to. When this happens, though, you may find yourself asking, why doesn't God give them what they deserve? I, think, I thought about all kinds of stories this week. I thought about Jim Elliott <laughs> going over to the Aka Indians down in Ecuador. Indians come out and kill him. You know what his wife could have said? His wife could have said, man, them bunch of no good Indians, I'm going to drop some bombs on them. But you know what she did? She prayed and asked God to give her strength and comfort. And you know what God chose to do? God chose to show grace to those Indians. He saved them. He stepped into their life and chose to save them. I don't understand God's grace, but it's not for me to understand this morning. But the first thing that I want you to understand is Jonah here is angry about grace. The second thing I want you to see is this. We don't deserve God's grace. Not a single one of us deserves God's grace. Jonah didn't deserve God's grace. Let's be honest. Jonah didn't deserve God's grace. Many people have the attitude that we deserve grace or that we are entitled to grace. That grace is, I want you to, uh, maybe a different definition to help you think differently this morning about grace. I always grew up with God's unmerited favor. But grace is God stepping into the lives of individual with the purpose of saving them. God is not under obligation to do so. God has total freedom to do what he pleases. Go with me, hold your finger here and go with me to Psalm 115 and verse number 3. Psalm 115 and verse 3. I don't want to make you mad this morning as we go through this, but I, I want you to see this. This is a huge subject for the grace of God. No way we could cover every nook and cranny of it. But in Psalm 115 and verse 3, the Bible says this. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. So what does that mean? God has total freedom to do what he pleases. God's going to do what pleases himself. I want to ponder this description of grace for a moment. God steps into the lives of individuals with the purpose of saving them. And, and, and I want to make this statement to go along with it. Without this intervention in your life and mine, neither of us would have any hope of being saved. If God had not stepped into your life, you would not have any hope of being saved this morning. By nature, no one seeks God. Not you, not me, not anyone. The best person, the, the best unsaved person this morning, the person that's done the most good works in their life and they're not saved, they have no ability in their own strength to even seek after God. They have none. The Bible's very clear about this. Romans chapter 3 and verse 11. There is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after God. There is none this morning, unregenerate people that are seeking after God. They have no ability to seek after God. The idea that we have the capacity in ourselves to go seeking after God is completely foreign to the Bible. Romans chapter 3 and verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You didn't do good. I didn't do good. What happened? God stepped into your life and gave you the faith and, the, and bestowed grace on you. Gave you the faith to believe on him and bestowed the grace on you to save you. That's what happened in your life. By nature, I do not see the glory. I do not seek after the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Uh, those that are unsaved in this world today, they've been blinded. By Satan himself. 
Uh, why? Because Satan doesn't want them to see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, that he should shine unto them. So Satan is, 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 is as a roaring lion. He's seeking, uh, roaming about seeking whom he may devour. And he goes to all the lost people and he blinds them because he does not want them to see the glorious light of Jesus Christ. By nature, my heart is hard towards God. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. By nature, your heart was stony. By nature, you were blinded to God. But not only that, by nature, I love darkness rather than light. In John chapter 3 and verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. By nature... I want the praise of men more than the affirmation of God. John chapter 5 and verse 44. How can we believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? You see, if we're not careful, I'm not even if we're not careful, as an unsaved person by nature, I'm more worried about the praise of men than I am about God. By nature, I'm a prisoner of sin. Romans chapter 7 and verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringeth me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, when you grasp the biblical teaching about the effects of sin on the human soul, it will become obvious to you that grace must involve more than God providing a way of salvation. Grace isn't just that God provided a way of salvation, it's more than that. Uh, and so, and so we have to understand this, uh, grace has to be God stepping into our lives and the lives of individual to save them. If God doesn't step into your life, you're hopelessly lost because there's nothing in and of yourself that can save you. An example of this in the Bible is the life of Saul. This man was the terror of the early church. He was the supervisor of of the death of Stephen, who was the first Christian martyr in the, in the, that, we, that we see there in the New Testament. Saul was on his way to Damascus, where he planned to threaten and slaughter a small community of believers. And you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it for you. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. That's, that was Saul, all right? It's pretty intense hostility. He's going to threaten and slaughter. He was in the same mindset of a terrorist who might seek to slaughter Christians worshiping in a church today. And one thing is certain, Saul was not seeking faith in Jesus Christ. Saul was not on his way to Damascus saying, where's God? I'm I'm looking for God. Where's God at? He was going with the intent to threaten and to slaughter believers. That's what Paul was doing. And, 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 and so we see this. And we know this. Christ stopped this man in his tracks with a blinding light. And with an audible voice on the road to Damascus in, Roman, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You see, Saul was not looking for Jesus. But Jesus came looking for Saul. I hope that you'll understand this this morning. Saul wasn't looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for Saul. The persecutor of the Christians. But Jesus came looking for him and Saul the persecutor, by the grace of God, became Paul the Apostle. Not because Paul was worthy, not because Paul deserved it, but because God chose to bestow grace on Paul. The point is this, Paul did not deserve God's grace and God was not obligated to give him grace. Christ swooped into this man's life uninvited. That's grace. 
And without it, nobody would be saved. John chapter 6 and verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. So God tells us very plainly in John, you can't even come to me unless the Spirit or unless the Father, talking about the Father sending the Spirit, hath sent me draw him. God showed up in Nineveh. I want you to understand this. God stepped into the lives of these people in this city and God saved them. That's grace. They didn't deserve it. God was not obligated, but he chose to show grace. Now, number three, I'm going to talk about this and I'm done. Not only do we not deserve God's grace, But we must be careful of this. Jonah thought that God wasn't fair. Or if you're just taking notes, I just put on my notes, God, that's not fair. God, that's not fair. I get that from my kids. Uh, they were the ones that gave me the point for this. Um, I hear it about 30 times a day. God, Dad, that's not fair. Jonah's sitting there saying, God, that's not fair. You know, most people would object or would not object to the idea of God stepping into people's lives in order to save them. The problem most of us would have is the idea that he does not step into all lives. Grace says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And there's an instinct in us that wants to say to God, that's not fair. It's fine that you love Jacob. But you have to do the same for Esau to make it fair. Paul faces this problem head on in Romans chapter 9. Go with me to Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. The Bible says in Romans chapter 9 and verse 13, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is he not fair? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Verse 18, jump down to verse 18. Therefore hath no mercy, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will he hardeneth. Do you see what God is saying? God is saying here he reserves the right to decide where, when, and whom he will have mercy. This is not my business, it's God's business. There is no right to mercy. Mercy is God's gift, not a right. If God were under obligation to save us, then mercy would be, uh, no longer be mercy because it would be required. Uh, it could no longer be freely given. And we love that song, Freely Given, amen? Uh, freely, freely. And, and, and so, but if God was under obligation, then it wouldn't be free anymore. The conclusion to all of this is that salvation does not depend on man's effort or desire, but on God's mercy. I hope you understand that. You are saved not because you had a desire to be saved or because you made an effort to be saved. Your salvation flows from God mercifully intervening in your life and moving you to faith and repentance. And without that, you would have no opportunity to be saved. Jonah didn't think it was fair that God would save the Ninevites. But it wasn't Jonah's choice. It was God's and it was his grace. And you see, the thing that excites me about his grace is this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. If you want to turn there with me, I'm going to read this verse and I'm done. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. What excites me about this is God's grace and mercy reaches a whole lot further than my grace and mercy would reach. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together 
with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. You know what God is? He's rich in mercy. You see, Jonah didn't think that the Ninevites deserved it. But God's rich in it. You might be here this morning. You may not think that you deserve it. You don't. But God is rich in mercy if you'll come to him. We must be obedient to proclaiming the gospel. And as it is preached, God will draw some to himself. And when he does, it will be because of his grace. You know, that's what I love about the ministry. People getting saved, in essence, don't de doesn't depend on me. I used to believe that for many years. It depends on me. If I don't say the right thing, I don't do the right thing. Hey, if God's not drawing them anyway, they're not getting saved. <laughs> I just do what God's asked me to do. I go out and preach the gospel. I go out and share my testimony. I go out and share my faith. I be obedient to what God would have me to do. And God is the one that moves in and shows grace and brings a heart to repentance. I thank God that it's him that does the work and not me. I would fail, but God never fails. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. Lord, I don't understand your grace completely. But Lord, this I do know, that it all depends on you. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you'd help us. Lord, there may be one this morning that you've moved into their heart. And you're wanting to bring them to repentance. And you're giving them faith this morning to believe on you. Lord, I pray this morning that they would respond to that. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. Lord, I pray that you'd help the rest of us. Lord, maybe we're like Jonah. There's people that we don't think deserve your grace. And we get mad when you show grace to an alcoholic. We get mad when you show grace to a rapist. We get mad when you show grace to people in the Middle East that we think have wacko views Lord I pray this morning that you would melt our hearts help us to understand that we're to be busy about the Father's business preaching the gospel preaching the, the message Lord and allowing you to move in and do what only you can do in people's hearts and lives we'll thank you and praise you for it and we ask this in your precious name let's stand together, we're going to have a verse of invitation Brother Kyle's going to lead us if God spoke to your heart this morning, why don't you come Maybe you need to do business with God. Maybe there's, maybe there's some things that you're just flat upset about right now. And you don't think that it's fair. You don't think God's grace is fair. Why don't you come and let God work in your heart. Maybe you need to be saved. Why don't you come?
may be seated. All right, if we'll have our ushers make the way to the front, we'll receive our offering this morning. I want to encourage you to be faithful to the Lord in giving. And um, appreciate all that you guys do. All right. Good to see Ted and Tammy back. I thought they were just going to stay in Florida for the next six months. Amen. And, uh, but uh, he uh, posted a picture this morning on uh, Facebook and Amelia Beach Month. He says, this is the wrong Amelia. Where's the beach? Has nobody ever taken them to East Fork? We've got a beach over there. Like, if that's all that they needed, like, why didn't we settle this like four months ago instead of him having to go build a house in Florida? Amen. Uh, Brother Ted, would you lead us in a word of prayer? three coming to unite with our church this morning uh, and uh, so we're excited about that we have Greg and Melissa and uh, we're uh, we'll have you we'll have them stand up here in just a second and what we want you to do is after church come by and shake their hands tell them well I don't know should we be doing that in COVID yeah yeah just elbow bump fist bump you know kiss on the cheek amen <laughs> hallelujah make sure it's a holy one though all right and then we got Brian that's coming to unite with our church this morning all right and uh, so uh, we're excited uh, about that. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll uh, have them come and stand up here in just a second. Uh, and then uh, Awana workers, if you work in Awana, uh, we need you for like two minutes in Coombs Chapel. We have some papers that we need to get you and some, some instruction on how to fill those papers out. Uh, but uh, just for two minutes across the way there. And uh, we, we appreciate that. Um, then uh, in two weeks will be our homecoming. And we're not doing anything big this year. We tried to do something big last year, and so uh, it's going to be kind of simple this year. Uh, but we are thinking about still trying to have lunch out under the pavilion. And uh, so if you're not going to be here next week, um, if you're going to be here next week, that's fine. But if you're not going to be here next week, can you get with uh, Raymond and tell him uh, what you can bring for food? Uh, and then, or you can call him and uh, let him know during the week if you're not going to be here next week. All right? Uh, and so those are all the announcements that I have. I appreciate you guys being here. Brian, Greg, Melissa, can I get you guys to stand up front here? And we're going to have a word of prayer. Brother Ed, would you come up here and stand with them? And uh, we'll, uh, we'll make it all happen. You guys stand right here in the front so that we can get people around and through. And that'll be, that'll be great. Let's have a word of prayer and you'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Lord, thank you for your grace. I want to pray that this week we'd be busy going out and proclaiming the gospel message because, Lord, we know that there's hearts that you want to move into and bestow grace on. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us with that. We'll thank you and praise you for it, and we ask this in your precious name. Amen.